I take full responsibility for my going to hell or heaven. Some people, when they wake up in hell, will be devastated. We need to tell people that every unforgiven sin, every sin committed by every person who rejects Jesus Christ will be justly punished by God forever in a place called hell. Just before I came down here, I'm late today because I was in the makeup room arguing with somebody who was telling me how all gay people are going to hell and now I'm going to hell with all the other gay people for doing, for doing the show. I take full responsibility for my going to hell or heaven. Let me put it this way. If you reject Christ, then the moment you take your first step through the gates of hell, the only thing you will hear is all of creation standing to its feet and applauding and praising God because God has rid the earth of you. Hello everyone, this is John Henry with the Gospel of Christ and welcome back to a new video. If this is your first time on the channel, I invite you to subscribe and click the bell button to be notified each time we upload a new video. In the Bible, it clearly states that homosexuality is wrong. And I feel that you are a powerful woman and you have done so much. And if you are going to represent, represent yourself as a Christian and then you're going to go on the show and say that you also support that, it's, it's double standarding. Well, I have and a different view of Christian than you do. Okay? And the God I serve, the God I serve doesn't care whether you're tall or short, or whether you were born um, uh, black, or Asian, or gay. And so, that's just a difference of belief. And I don't expect to change your belief today, because I have, just before I came down here, I'm late today, because I was in the makeup room arguing with somebody who was telling me how all gay people are going to hell, and now I'm going to hell with all the other gay people for doing, for doing the show. I take full responsibility for my going to hell or heaven. Some people, when they wake up in hell, will be devastated. And they won't find enough water in their eyes to satisfy their need to weep. They'll be sobbing. Oh no! Not here! Oh God, please have mercy upon me! be the greatest disappointment they could possibly experience to wake up in hell. But then the other group will be there, won't be weeping a bit. They'll be gnashing their teeth, which is a biblical metaphor for human fury. How dare you, God, put me here? The angry, or the anger of the damned will know no bounds. Now, as I said, I sure don't want to end up in hell. But one thing I know for sure, that if I do, if I've deceived myself all these years, and if I'm one who says, well, Lord, Lord, didn't I do this and didn't I do that? And he looks at me and says, please leave, I don't know you. And he sends me to hell. One thing I can promise you, that I'll be a weeper, not a gnasher. Because if I know anything about theology, I know that if he sent me to hell tonight, I could make no just complaint against him. I've been guilty of treason, cosmic treason. Every time I have sinned, I have asserted my will over the will of my creation, creator. I have declared that I am sovereign, 
not the Lord God. I've worked against his kingdom, not for it. I've sinned against a holy and infinitely righteous being who owes me nothing. And if I wake up in hell, I will realize I have only received what my life has merited. Not cruelty, not injustice, but perfect justice. There are those who claim to be preachers who don't ever talk about hell, wouldn't talk about hell, avoid it at all costs, when the truth of the matter is it ought to be the first thing that we talk about when we talk about the gospel. This is about salvation from hell. The doctrine of hell, the truth of hell, the reality of hell has found its way into the thinking of our culture. According to the latest survey that I could find, 75% of people living in America believe in hell. They believe there's a hell. That's the influence of Christianity, 75%. Of those 75%, 4% believe there is any chance that they will ever go there. So we've gotten our point across. There is a hell. But we haven't gotten the point across that you're headed there already. And you watch the outrage at least in the athletic world, if not in the Roman Catholic Church, over the sin of pedophilia. You don't find that outrage over adultery. You don't find that outrage over homosexuality. You don't find that outrage over lying, cheating, stealing, etc. People sin without immediate consequences. And to try to convince them that there are somehow down the road, decades from now, if they live, deferred consequences is a hard sell. You are storing up for yourself wrath in the day of wrath and the revelation of the righteous judgment of God. You're not getting away with anything. We need to tell people that every unforgiven sin, every sin committed by every person who rejects Jesus Christ will be justly punished by God forever in a place called hell. The 1611 King James Version made it clear even that early that the anger of God reached into hell. The message of Scripture is that salvation is a rescue a rescue from a real place called hell. Our Lord Jesus believed in eternal hell. He continually spoke about hell and he warned sinners to escape hell because of its horrible reality. You see, what you need to understand, well, let, let me put it this way, just to cut straight to the chase. Let me tell you the most terrifying thing that I can possibly tell you. The most terrifying truth that I can speak to you. Are you ready? Here it is. The most terrifying thing I can tell a man a woman, a child, is this. God is good. I said that a few years ago over in Europe when I was preaching. A secular university. I said, if you want to get down to it, the most terrifying news for man is this. God is good. 
And someone kind of laughed and said basically, and what's the problem with that? The problem with that is you're not good. Now, what does a good God do with someone like you? That's the greatest theological and philosophical problem in the Scriptures. God is good and that is terrifying. A hardened criminal working for some crime organization, if before he goes to court he is told that the judge is corrupt, he is full of joy. The most terrifying thing you can tell that criminal is the judge is not corrupt, he's good. It will fill him with terror. And see, this is the greatest problem of mankind. The greatest problem of mankind is God is good. Don't you see that? Because you're not. And therein lies the problem with modern day evangelical preaching. No one tells you who God really is. They just speak in cliches. You see, the other preachers can tell you God is good and you walk out feeling like you're totally released from any responsibility. I want to tell you that God is good and you ought to be terrified because you are not good. And there's the second half of the problem. No one's telling you what that means either. What does it mean that you're not good? How non-good or ungood are you? Let me put it this way. If you reject Christ, then the moment you take your first step through the gates of hell, the only thing you will hear is all of creation standing to its feet and applauding and praising God because God has rid the earth of you. That's how not good you are. You say, but my sin, I'm not that big of a sinner. Adam sinned once and threw the entire universe into total chaos and condemnation. You do not understand who this God is. He really is good. You're not. He really is love. You are the very opposite of that. So how can He let evil, loveless people into fellowship with Him. Well, why can't He simply forgive? Because He's just. You see, you were grown up in a culture where there is no justice. There's no pastor writing books like Lex Rex, The Law of the King. There's no one speaking about justice biblically. You see, God is just. And the greatest theological problem in the Bible is this. If God is just, He cannot forgive you. Do you hear me? If He's just, He cannot forgive you unless first His justice is satisfied. And that is what happened on the cross. That's why the cross is everything. It is absolutely everything on that tree. The only servant that Yahweh has ever had hung there. A perfect man. And the sins of God's people were cast upon him. And all the wrath, God's holy hatred for evil, for sin, for the wicked, Everything that should fall down upon your head throughout all of eternity fell down upon the head of God's only beloved Son. Every Easter Sunday I hear people preach about, you know, nails and spears and crowns of thorns and go through the medicals, you know, medical examiner's interpretation of the cross. And all that is important. It had to be a bloody death. But what they don't understand is they haven't preached the gospel. You're not saved if you're saved because the Romans beat up Jesus. If you're saved, it's because His own Father crushed Him under the full force of His wrath. Because someone had to pay for you. It was Him. People tell me, they say, well, you want to preach the gospel tonight? Yes, well, we understand that. No, you don't. 
if Ian Murray was here right now, if I could raise Jonathan Edwards from the dead, if Charles Spurgeon were to walk through the door, they would not profess to know the gospel in its fullness. And yet we've reduced the gospel down to four spiritual laws or five things God wants you to know and you all think you know it. You will spend an eternity studying the gospel and you will not even have reached the foothills of the glory of the thing. It's the gospel. God reconciling the world to Himself. God being just and not simply being able to turn His back or look over sin. God who must deal with the sin of His people. He must satisfy His justice in order to appease His wrath. And He does that by the death of His only Son, having suffered the wrath of God. And on the third day, rising again from the dead... And that resurrection did not, did not make him the Son of God, but it was God's public declaration of several things. First of all, this is my beloved Son, and who I am well pleased. Romans 1. Then you make your way over to Romans 4. What does it mean? That resurrection was God's sign that He had accepted Christ's death as atonement for the sins of His people, whereby they could be justified. Then Peter tells all the outraged leaders of the Jewish nation, this resurrection from the dead proves that this Jesus whom you crucified is both Lord and Christ. And the apostolic proclamation, the invitation for you to come to Christ, is not, would you like to pray this prayer and ask Jesus to come in? The apostolic proclamation is this, God commands all men everywhere to repent and believe the gospel. And preachers will tell me, what if you just tell them that and you don't give them something to do, then how will you know that they are saved? Because their life will change. I can go to most people in every tavern around this place tonight, and some of them really good church members. I can go there and ask them, are you saved? And they will say yes. I can go to most Southern Baptist colleges where the kids are beer bonging and go, are you saved? And they'll say, most certainly we are. Why? Because one time, some preacher who should not be preaching the gospel led them in a sinner's prayer and pronounced over them that they were converted. Dealt with their soul possibly two or three minutes. No, my dear friend, no. You are saved by repenting of your sins. You are saved by believing the gospel and the evidence that you have repented unto salvation and that you have believed unto salvation is that you continue repenting and continue believing.